Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Amy Jill Levine, and we'll discuss her scholarly work. Amy Jill Levine is professor at Vanderbilt Divinity School and College of Arts and Science, and has written several books on the Bible and early Christianity. Welcome to St. Norbert College. Pleasure to be here. Well, when we were putting together this intro, uh, we couldn't decide uh, how many of your various titles and affiliations we should include, and in the end, we decided to just ask you. So, <laughs> at the risk of sounding immodest, please tell us uh, what your various titles and chairs and uh, et cetera are. Oh gosh, if I can remember that. <laughs> uh, my formal title is University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies, E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Professor of New Testament Studies and Professor of Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt University Divinity School and College of Arts and Science, as well as affiliated faculty, Wolf Institute Center for Jewish Christian Relations, Cambridge, United Kingdom. I would have never gotten through that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a little, you know, tick thing in my head that I can just read it off mentally. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about what it is that you study and, and what it is that you do with all of those uh, Im impressive titles. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly I have fun because it's such a good subject area. What do I do? Uh, my primary job is to train Christian ministers how to read the New Testament, which for a, a Jew and indeed a member of an Orthodox synagogue is a little odd for a job. Uh, but the research that I do, I look at both biblical traditions, the Jewish biblical tradition and the Christian tradition, starting with Genesis and for the New Testament, working up through Revelation and indeed some of the early non-canonical Christian works, to try to figure out what the texts meant in their own context when they were written, what they meant over time, how different traditions, Jewish and Christian, interpreted those texts over time, and then more broadly how Jews and Christians relate today, both in terms of individuals and in terms of people who read scripture. In one of your books, I read that you had mentioned that uh, you grew up Jewish, but you grew up with a lot of Catholic friends. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that obviously had some influence on what it is that you decided to study. Can you talk a little bit about growing up in that environment? Sure. Um, I grew up in southeastern Massachusetts, so my, most of my neighbors were Portuguese Roman Catholic. Consequently, my introduction to Christianity is ethnic Roman Catholicism, which was fabulous. It was wonderful food, uh, good songs, really good uh, liturgical traditions. Um, and my parents explained to me that Christianity was very, very much like Judaism. So I, I kind of looked at what my Catholic friends were doing as, yeah, it's in the ballpark or it's in the family. It's just not quite, quite what we're doing. Um, I remember um, when John the 23rd died, and I was a child at the time, watching television. I couldn't figure out why cartoons weren't on because it's the funeral of John the 23rd. And I said to my mother, who is this guy and why can't I watch cartoons? And she explained that John the 23rd, he was the Pope, he was good for the Jews. So I started watching this, and as, as I was watching, I learned, because uh, I knew nothing about who the Pope was or what the Pope did. You got to live in Italy, which to me meant you got to eat spaghetti. Uh, you got to wear <laughs> fabulous white clothes. I like wearing white. Um, and you can stand up in cars and people cheer you, and it's good for the Jews. So I said to my mother, I want to be Pope, right, because I can eat spaghetti and it's good for the Jews. And my mother looked at me and said, you cannot. And I said, why not? And she said, because you're not Italian. <laughs> so, you know, so I've always had this kind of external interest. And, and what that pointed out to me actually quite early on is that Jews and Christians don't understand each other. Uh, and we don't even know what questions to ask. We simply presuppose things. So one of the things I'm very interested in doing is helping members of one group understand the other. And I look at myself as a translator. I'm fluent in Catholic, I'm fluent in Jew, uh, and I'm pretty good at most major Protestant dialects. <laughs> so I can help people understand each other. Well, what are some of those uh, misunderstandings? I mean, as a, as a Catholic, you know, how, how do you think uh, Jews are viewed by Catholics now? And maybe that's a little different than it was before. But uh, how do Jews view Christians and, and Catholics in particular? Uh, well, we all have certain stereotypes, and, and of course not everybody holds them, but there are certain general places where ignorance steps in as opposed to, to actual knowledge. Um, for Christians broadly construed looking at Jews, um, a number of, of Christians are convinced that um, all Jews follow all the laws in Leviticus. We don't. Uh, 
um, that all Jews believe and practice exactly the same way. We don't. We're really quite an autonomous group. We've got no head Jew to tell us what to do anyway. Um, that Jews follow biblical law in order to earn a place into heaven rather than recognize that Judaism, like Christianity, sees ourselves as under covenant with God, and the covenant is based on love and grace. It's the divine initiative to us, not our sense of earning divine love. Um, that most Jews have no clue what the New Testament says. We have no clue about Jesus or Paul because most of us have never read the Christian canon and most of us unfortunately don't ask our Christian neighbors, what do you believe? How do you practice? How do you understand your relationship to the church? And the problems come on the other side as well. So um, Jews mistaking Christianity, um, concerns about what do Catholics think about the Virgin Mary and is, is, is it not a trinity, is it sort of a, a four-person thing? Um, Jews think that all Catholics do exactly what the Pope says, right? The Vatican should be so lucky. Um, so uh, uh, lacking a sense of the, the individual Catholic con conscience. Um, most Jews are unfamiliar with the very, very strong Catholic tradition in terms of social justice and concern for the poor. Jews don't understand issues of uh, the gift of celibacy or how um, uh, people living in religious communities, women religious or monks or priests function because we have no way of getting that information without asking and we don't ask. Well, one of the ironies, of course, is that Jesus Christ was a Jew. Yes. And, um, you know, uh, I think Christians often don't think about the historical figure of, of Jesus. Um, but you study this and, and you pay attention to that. So tell us a little bit about who Jesus, the person, was and the time and place that he lived. Yeah. Um, I think today most, most Christians get the idea that Jesus was Jewish, uh, but they don't have much content to that label. It's just like saying somebody's an American, but in what, what exactly does that tell us in terms of belief and practices? Jesus is completely embedded in his, in his Jewish environment. And I think if both Jews and Christians took that more seriously, it would be very good for interfaith relations. For example, um, Jesus spends a lot of time debating fellow Jews on how to follow God's word, how to follow Torah. This does not set him over against Judaism. It puts him in the heart of Judaism. Because one thing that Jews do is debate how to follow the law. Um, the Torah says, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And as soon as Moses came down the mountain and said this, you know, one Jew looks at another and says, how? And the next thing you know, you've got two synagogues. Um, so we're always debating, how, how, how best do you live out what God wants? Um, Jesus teaches in synagogues. Uh, he goes to the temple in Jerusalem. And I don't think in the scene that's normally called the cleansing of the temple, he wanted fully to do away with it because otherwise I don't understand why his followers continued to worship in the temple. So even Jesus and his followers, uh, who were all initially Jewish, uh, James and Peter and Mary Magdalene and Mary and Martha, they're all Jews, and they're continuing to do very Jewish things. They just also happen to believe that Jesus was their Lord and Savior. And in a first century Jewish context, that made sense within Judaism. So Jesus himself and the proclamation of his being the Messiah or his being divine in a first century Jewish context made some sense. But as the centuries went past and the synagogue went in its direction and the church went in that, its direction, by the time the fourth century comes around, Christian claims no longer make sense in a Jewish context and in turn Jewish practice no longer makes sense in a Christian context. So what we can do by looking at Jesus is recover those common roots and what I can do is actually do Jewish history by looking at the Gospels. Right. In fact, you've written how the New Testament is essentially Jewish literature. In, in Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, how is that received uh, when, you, when you go before Christian audiences to talk about that? Um, well, nobody's thrown anything at me yet, so I mean, I, I think it's pretty good, and they keep inviting me to come back, so that's also good. Um, for the most part, it's received um, with delight, because what I can do is say, here's a text you've been reading all your life, now let's look at the context. Let's try to hear what Jesus would have sounded like to the people who initially heard him. Let's try to recover the parables uh, in, as, as first century Jewish stories and how they might have been heard. So I'm not interested in stripping away 2,000 years worth of Christian history or doctrine. All that stays in place. What I can do is enhance the material by saying to people in the church, here are a few other things you might want to consider. So it tends to work well. And I do believe that one treats other people's religious texts 
with the respect that the text deserves and with the respect that the people who hold those texts sacred deserve. So I come in with an enormous amount of respect both for the New Testament as literature and history and for Christians who hold that text sacred. Well, can you talk a little bit about the, the New Testament as, as literature? Um, maybe a lot of folks don't know that it wasn't necessarily written contemporaneously with, with Jesus' life and the immediate aftermath. How did uh, the, these uh, accounts of Jesus' life wind up as we know them today? Yeah. Um, we don't have a sense that anybody is sort of following Jesus around with an iPad saying, you know, can you repeat the Good Samaritan again so I can get the details? Um, but Jesus used such arresting language, such, such extraordinary stories that they wound up being imprinted in people's memories and, and his actions, the exorcisms, the healings, um, uh, his relationship with his followers. Um, he's continually eating, by the way, so these, these fellowship meals uh, that he would have established as if they're foretastes of that messianic banquet. Um, people remembered this material. And as time went on, particularly after the first generations were dying out and the second coming hadn't occurred, people began to write stuff down, memorizing it and recalling it as best as they could, given the frailty of human memory. Um, and that's why, in part, we have four Gospels in the canon and then other Gospels that did not make the canonical cut, all telling us more or less what individual people remembered about Jesus, recording some of the stories that they might have heard from a person, uh, an elder, or perhaps somebody who had just encountered Jesus on one moment. So what we have are composite documents based on memory. The Gospel of Mark was probably composed sometime around the year 70 or so, so 30 to 40 years after Jesus' death, Matthew and Luke and John probably later than that, moving up toward the end of the first century. So what do we have? We have the stories of Jesus as they were passed down in oral tradition. But the gospel writers are also pastors, and they have to give a message not only of here's what happened, but a message to their communities, here's why you should care. So in telling their stories, they tell them differently because they're addressing different audiences with different concerns. I think that's part of the glory of the New Testament, is it gives you different snapshots of Jesus. And that would be correct because he would have struck different people in different ways. Well, how, how, did, the, uh, how did Christianity go from being primarily a Jewish I don't know, sect, if that yeah. it would be uh, acceptable, to uh, a broader religion ultimately splitting with Judaism? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, um, how did it become <laughs> Gentilized, I guess, would be a question. <laughs> um, it, the initial followers, of course, are all Jewish. Uh, but Jews have strong connections with the Gentile world. Jews are not only located in, in Galilee and Judea. They're located in Antioch and Athens and Rome and in Egypt uh, and in North Africa and Carthage. Um, so as Jews started telling stories about this Jesus fellow, um, and as some of Jesus' followers began to be dispersed to various areas, uh, whether through some initial rejection in their own locations or through, uh, through trade um, or through tourism, which was something that happened back then as well, the stories of Jesus began to travel. Um, Gentiles, non-Jews, were welcome to worship in synagogues. We have lots of evidence of that. Um, and it may well have been the case that these various Gentiles in a synagogue would have heard Jews talking about this Jesus fellow uh, and thought, that sounds interesting. This sounds like a fulfillment of some of the promises that we read about in the Jewish scripture. Um, they were convinced by claims that Jesus had come back from the dead. People had said, I experienced a resurrection appearance or I heard this. Um, and Gentiles began to become intrigued. So now we have Gentiles in a Jewish context following Jews in a Jewish context who were Jesus' followers. What happened? The church eventually spread to the Gentile world. We can see that most clearly through the writings of Paul of Tarsus. Um, and not only was this a message, a Jewish message, but it was also a universal message. So here's what Paul and his, his fellow apostles, fellow missionaries would have done. They would have set up in a little store uh, somewhere in you know, the slums of Corinth uh, or a, a neighborhood in Ephesus. And Paul would have welcomed people in and, you know, he's doing his leather work and he's got some friends there. And they start telling Jesus stories. And he also would have said, you know, if you're hungry, we'll feed you. If you have somebody who's sick, we'll come sit by the bedside and we'll help you out. If you're lonely, we'll provide you a family because everybody is a new member of this family of faith. 
uh, will take care of you on earth. And by the way, you can have eternal life. And all you need to do is believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then, by the way, you have to do good works following. This was one of the best deals in antiquity because the hottest commodity in the pagan religious marketplace, what pagans, what Gentiles really wanted, they wanted life after death and they wanted community. And the church says, we'll provide you both and it won't cost you a thing. This is the best deal in town. Jews, meanwhile, for the most part are saying, I think, a number really like Jesus' program of social justice, really like Jesus' program of family values, really like Jesus' sense that if you follow him, you're living as if you've got one foot in the kingdom of God already. But they didn't think he was the Messiah because for most Jews at the time, the Messiah meant the coming of the Messianic age, a general resurrection of the dead where everybody comes back, peace on earth, goodwill toward everybody. Uh, you can get decent parking at the local grocery store. I mean, it's, it's, it's whatever everybody wants. We could use some of that here, actually. Indeed. Um, and that didn't happen. So I think a number of Jews who were very attracted to Jesus' message of social justice, uh, who were very interested in his teaching and found him to speak to their heart, eventually concluded that it was a good run, but he wasn't the Messiah because the Messianic age hadn't come about and decided we have to keep waiting. So the Gentiles accepted the message and the Jews said, we like the ethical concerns, but he's not the Messiah. So, so here we are, we're 2,000 years later, and um, the, 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 the two religions have kind of gone in different directions, yet they remain linked through the, through the scriptures. Yeah. And one of the things I find kind of interesting is the degree to which evangelical Christians um, really believe in the cause of Israel and are very supportive of that. Um, t talk about why that might be the case. Uh -huh. um, when the State of Israel was founded uh, by United Nations decree in 1948, a number of evangelicals thought that that was the beginning of the Messianic age because one of the Messianic signs is the idea that Jews dispersed through all the nations of the world would eventually return to Israel. Um, and they need to be there to welcome Jesus back. Now, here, by the way, I'm personally holding up the show because I don't intend to emigrate to Israel. I'm very happy living in the United States. Um, so that was, that was the beginning of this new apocalyptic burgeoning. Uh, the, the messianic signs are being fulfilled. There's also a sense among some American evangelicals um, that God blesses those who bless the children of Abraham. And this goes back to Genesis. So if they would support the children of Abraham, the Jews in their, in their traditional homeland, that that would be a way that God would in turn bless them. And that has some implications for American politics. America, in the eyes of some of these evangelicals, needs to be supportive of Israel because that way God will bless America. What we do find today in various conversations about the Middle East are splits. There were some Jews who are um, unquestioningly in support of Israel regardless of what the state of Israel does. And there are other Jews, myself included, that take certain issue with some Israeli policy. I'm not a great fan of things like settlement expansion into what looks to me like the Palestinian homeland. And I don't think that, um, I, I am a Zionist in the sense that I think that Jews have a homeland like everybody else has a homeland and we should be able to live there in peace and safety. But I don't think that precludes Palestinians from having a homeland as well. I think the land can actually be shared and then we have to rely on uh, heaven help them diplomats to establish what the borders are. So even within evangelical circles, there are some evangelicals who will argue that the entire land has to be in Israeli control and there can be no Palestinian state whatsoever. But there are also evangelicals who are in favor of a two-state solution. The problems there are intractable. Nobody is behaving terribly well. Um, and, um, you know, the ultimate tragedy, I think, here is that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all claim to be children of Abraham. It's about time they started to get along, difficult as though that may be. It, it is a sibling rivalry, not to trivialize it, but, but it is. I think that uh, Christians have some of the same issues with, uh, with uh, Islam. Yeah. that, that uh, w Christians don't recognize Muhammad as uh, the same kind of a prophet that, that uh, Muslims do. It, are there really parallels between the way Jews look at Christians and the way that Christians look at uh, Muslims? 
Uh, to some extent, there are. Um, so that when my Christian friends might say to me, you know, why don't you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior because he came to fulfill your tradition? I could easily say, why don't you accept Muhammad as God's final prophet because he came to correct and fulfill the traditions that got off track with Judaism and Christianity, sort of standard Islamic teaching. Or in turn, say to some of my normative Christian or Catholic friends, um, why aren't you a Mormon because Joseph Smith came to give a new revelation, to which the response is, well, because I'm not. Right? Um, so there are some parallels. But there's also a distinction, at least in, in the West, um, in, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, Jews and Christians have been neighbors and we've been getting along generally well for a couple of hundred years. So we know each other. Uh, but most of us who are Jewish and Christian don't know very many Muslims. There may not be a mosque in our area. Uh, we're even more hesitant to be able to speak to our Muslim friends. So whereas Jews and Christians better know each other today than we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago, there's a whole learning curve where we need to catch up on what is it that Muslims do. And at the same time recognize that Muslims are no more monolithic than Jews are monolithic or Christians are monolithic. Muslims have different views with different practices depending upon where they're from, depending upon their traditions. Yeah. Hmm. You're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us is biblical scholar Amy Jill Levine. And one of the other things that you do, many things that you do, is uh, study feminism and the role of women in the church and in uh, Jewish tradition. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing to do because I think many might think that, wow, these are a couple of patriarchal systems. Um, how, do you, how do you balance feminism? How do you study feminism as part of those uh, long traditions? Sure. Well, they are patriarchal systems. Um, but what I can do is, as an historian, I can do my best to recover the role of women at the time. So I can talk about what, what were women's lives like uh, at the time of Jesus and why might women have followed Jesus. And here I'm not only doing New Testament history, I'm also doing Jewish history. And what do I find? I find things like Women owned their own homes. Uh, Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, not Lazarus's. Uh, the house church in Jerusalem is at the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Um, women serve as patrons of the Jesus movement. I mean, Jesus is clearly engaging in, in what? Free health care. Somebody's got to pay the bills. And according to the Gospel of Luke, it's Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna and other women who provided for him according to their means. That means they're patrons. Uh, women have use of their own funds, like the woman who spent all her money on physicians, not that it helped her, uh, or the widow who puts her two coins in the temple treasury, or the woman who anoints Jesus. That's her ointment she's using. They have freedom of travel. Uh, women follow Jesus from Galilee down to Jerusalem, which is how the women from Galilee find themselves at the cross and find themselves at the tomb. Uh, uh, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Uh, women show up in synagogues, the bent over lady who gets healed, they show up in the temple, like Mary who goes to the temple a couple of times in the Gospel of Luke, um, or all those children in the temple who hailed Jesus, children come with mommies. So I can locate Jewish women's history and, and it turns out that they're not so oppressed and repressed and suppressed and depressed by Judaism that they sign on to the Jesus program. To the contrary, they've got prominent roles in the Jewish system and they're expecting those same sort of prominent roles in the church, which is in part why Paul tells us that there's a woman apostle whose name is Junia, there's a woman deacon whose name is Phoebe, both mentioned in Romans 16, and when women are prophesying in Corinth, well of course they're prophesying in Corinth because they would have prophesied in Judaism and in pagan traditions as well. Was that uh, considered the norm for the ancient Middle East or was that, did women have more freedom, uh, Jewish women have more freedom than other women in the, in the ancient Middle East? It's more or less comparable. So when we look at, at pagan sources of the time, Gentile sources, in, in Rome in particular, uh, Rome, first century Rome was a bit of a heyday for, for, for women's rights. But what happened as time went on, um, the church puts on more control, puts greater breaks on women's activity. And we see similar breaks coming in in the Jewish system, in the rabbinic system. So the first century was a little bit more um, open to women's public participation and indeed women's leadership. Second, third century, uh, fourth century, the rabbis are constraining women to particular roles and the church is doing the same thing. You edited a, edited a book not too long ago, uh, a collection of essays about 
feminism in in the church, and two of those uh, essays were about Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Uh, why do you think she's such a fascinating figure to us? Why is she important? Um, she is the one consistent figure at the tomb as you go from Matthew to Mark to Luke to John. So there are other women who were there, but Mary Magdalene only in the Gospel of John, um, without other women there. Um, I think in part she's, she's of interest to us because we don't have much background on her. And when we have an important character who is the first witness to the resurrection, we want to know a little bit more about her so people fill in the gaps. The Gospel of Luke and only Luke describes her as having been possessed by seven demons. Well, that sounds interesting. Let's figure <laughs> out what that is. Uh, the early church had to deal with her as this, this very close person who, in the Gospel of John, uh, before dawn when she's at the tomb uh, and, and she realizes the tomb is empty and she thinks somebody has stolen the body you know, and she sees Jesus from a distance and he doesn't recognize her and she thinks he's the gardener and says, Ta tell me where you've taken the body and I'll go recover it. And then he calls her by name and she responds, Rabuni, my teacher. This is actually a literary convention in the ancient world and John's readers would have recognized it. What is it? It's part of what's called the Hellenistic Romance. Um, we know this, by the way, from Romeo and Juliet, where lovers have been separated. One thinks the other is dead. There's an initial misrecognition, and then there's the final recognition, the reuniting of the lovers. And John's readers would have seen that, and John's readers would have also said, ah, but this doesn't go quite in the way we thought this was going to go. This is not a reunion of a man and wife. This is a reunion of Jesus and Mary, and Mary is then commissioned to go tell the boys, to go tell the guys the resurrection has occurred. That is a very deep analysis, I think far deeper than most uh, Christians have really thought it through. I mean, I think uh, um, maybe a lot of Christians sort of think about uh, these various characters in, in the New Testament as being um, kind of similar to the, to the creche. You know, they're kind uh. of little statues that, uh, that, that uh, surround, surround Jesus, and Jesus is the main story. But understanding him in, as a person in that kind of historical context, I think, is, is a fascinating thing. One of the things that you have done a lot of work in is not just excellent scholarly work, but bringing that scholarly work to folks in a way that is engaging. And uh, I, I know that you've done a, uh, a course for the teaching company. Three. Three courses. A and I, I have to say, I've, I've listened to some of them, not, not yours, but I'm going to. Good. Um, <laughs> they pick tremendous lecturers uh, to do that. Are you in a classroom doing that, or are you sitting <laughs> in a studio trying to mimic what it's like to talk uh, to a bunch of people? How, how, do, they, how do they record those? Um, it actually is a studio in Chantilly, Virginia. Uh, but there, there's a, a live audience there because they want the professors actually to be teaching a class. So there were two separate tables because there were two cameras, so we can look at one then the other. Um, some professors work off of teleprompters. I can't do that. I need to watch my students so that if the student is frowning or looks confused, then I need to say a little bit more to provide a gloss. And if the student looks kind of bored of thinking, okay, I've now covered this, I'll move on to something else. Um, the students who were there register to take the courses and they're sitting there with a detailed outline of what I'm going to talk about. And their job is not only to provide me the prompts for pedagogy, but they're also checking to make sure I don't make a mistake. So that if I wind up saying Peter when I meant to say Paul, they can say, aha, looking at the giant digital clock counting down from 30 minutes. At minute 22, second 14, sub-second 12, Professor Levine said Peter rather than Paul. And then I have to go and redub. So that's what they're doing. Because as someone who's given a lot of lectures to students over the years, I could imagine how self-conscious you must be in that kind of an environment. It's not every day that you're lecturing with, uh, you know, you know, for, for, for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but at least with those lectures I can redo if I flub up. <laughs> well, your students are very lucky to have you as a, as a professor. Unfortunately, we're out of time. This has been absolutely a fascinating uh, half hour. Thank you for, for being here. I hope you've all enjoyed our show today. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.